What's your question, brother? So I was uh, re-watching one of your uh, lectures that you gave uh, that I think it's available on Aira, Aira's channel uh, about Islam, evolution, and uh, Darwinism, which, by the way, it was a spectacular lecture. It was one of the key uh, uh, lectures that I've watched back when I was becoming practicing again. Um, and to sort of clear my doubts and evolution was one of the biggest, uh, I would say one of the biggest, uh, issues, which I was struggling with back before I started practicing again. And after watching that, uh, specific lecture, it was like, just gone. And it was just so well done. And so my question is like, just the way that you sort of presented your arguments in, in that lecture and, uh, you sort of, you know, I think stayed consistent on, from there onwards in, in how you sort of refute and dismantle Darwinism. So like, my question is like, how, how hasn't Darwinism been challenged in the way you have been, you've challenged it at a larger academic scale, considering you, you basically did it so easily, in my opinion, it's like, you just did it like completely, you know, it was just like, wasn't even, I mean, it looked like you made it, you know, it was effortless. Yeah. I mean, I guess the answer we could find in Thomas Nagel's book, uh, Mind and Cosmos. He's a philosopher who wrote a book, uh, published by Oxford nonetheless, right? So like he's an atheist philosopher. And what what he talks about is the fact that Darwinism is not a well-established scientific theory based on evidence alone. He says it's a metaphysical research program governing the science. Mind and Cosmos is a book written by Thomas Nagel, who is a philosopher. He has no training in biology. Reviews of the book generated significant criticism from numerous scientists and philosophers. Quote mining is a very poor method of advancing your argument. If, however, you are going to quote mine, you should at least get the right source, as the quote of evolution being a metaphysical research program was not made by Thomas Nagel, but instead by Karl Popper. Popper was talking about natural selection, not evolution. He was wrong about it being an untestable theory and he had the humility to admit later on that he was wrong in this regard. I will link this article in the description. So what, what it is, Mahad, right, essentially, today the way science works, it works on a premise of methodological naturalism, right? Methodological naturalism is we are going to assume every single thing has natural causation. Why is that assumption made? It's because science can only test for the supernatural. There is no way to reliably test for the supernatural. Therefore, the supernatural cannot be part of science. And let's do a thought experiment. I'm going to test this with you, right? Mm -hmm. Say we right now create a planet, some hypothetical planet, um, like on some computer simulation. And we have a human being there, like some AI intelligence type of human and we input in the data of that um, being there is no god now that being has to explain the giraffe a blade of grass a bee all of life is it not going to come up with some sort of naturalistic explanation naturally yes. why why would it come up with naturalistic there's no other recourse there's no other recourse this is very important if you from the output sorry from the onset you say there is no god then every single explanation you give has to be naturalistic. This option for a naturalistic explanation is not caused by a disbelief in the supernatural. Somebody can believe in the supernatural, but due to methodological naturalism, science cannot test for the supernatural and therefore cannot include it in scientific theories. If the supernatural interacts with the natural, as shown by the yellow part of this diagram, then science can detect that effect, but could still not conclude that the cause was supernatural. Ultimately, if the supernatural is excluded, then it is because supernatural entities like gods, spirits, ghosts and whatever else have chosen not to interact and demonstrate themselves in an unambiguous way. Okay. Since science is based on methodological naturalism, then Darwinism is, in fact, the only thing that's going to explain life. This is what you have to keep in mind. Naturalism, if naturalism entails Darwinism. So if 
and this is very important to understand, if there is no God, then everything has to be explained naturalistically. And the simplest naturalistic explanation is life is very complicated. So going back, there must have been fewer, simpler, smaller forms of life. That's it. So this goes back to um, there's a Greek thinker um, who speaks about this. I should have actually taken notes on this. This is going back to the ancient Greeks. Mm. Um, and what he basically describes is he describes some sort of evolutionary theory. Because remember, evolution goes back way before Darwin, right? Because if there is no God, then it's a logical deduction. Mm. So as a mathematician, you know what that means, right? If there is no God, then the only way you can explain life is via something naturalistic. And Darwinism is the only thing that does that. So what I did in that talk is, especially at the end, you must have seen I speak about naturalism. Right? I speak about naturalism. It's the naturalistic belief which forces them to close the doors to all other explanations. No, it is not due to a naturalistic belief, as I have just explained. It is due to a limitation of the scientific method which is unable to reliably test for the supernatural. So this is why Darwin, because look, this is the way science works. Science doesn't leave a void. You can't have a theory being replaced by nothing. It has to be replaced by a better theory. But if Darwinism has to be replaced by, say, intelligent design as a theory, we have to accept that there is a God, or at least a potentiality that there could be something like a designing force. So on... The best way I would put it to you is Philip Johnson has written a book called The Wedge of Truth, right? And this book is amazing. In that book, you will see the fundamental problem that we're talking about is not evidence. It's not to do with biochemistry or DNA or fossils or bioinformatics or whatever. It's actually got to do with whether you begin your discussion of biology with the belief that it's all nature or you begin your discussion of biology with an open toolbox epistemically which allows natural and supernatural explanations. The book to which he is referring, The Wedge of Truth, is written by Philip Johnson. He is an opponent of evolutionary science, one of the founders of the intelligent design movement and a co-author of The Wedge Document. He is explicit about the Christian principles underlying his philosophy and that of the intelligent design movement and that the goal of the intelligent design movement is to promote a theistic agenda as a scientific concept. In his later years, he admitted that there is no theory of intelligent design and admitted that the neo-Darwinism theory is a fully worked out scheme. Sabor talks about having an open epistemological toolbox that allows for the natural and supernatural explanations. The problem is, how do you examine these supernatural explanations? For example, there are various creation myths from different cultures and religions all around the world. How do you test them and decide which ones are true and which ones are false? This is impossible as they are all supernatural. Of course, Sabor thinks you should just accept the supernatural claims of his religion and ignore the supernatural claims of any other belief system. However, this is not science. That That is the problem, because what we're taught in school is the toolbox is closed on one side. You can only use naturalistic tools. The theist says, no, we will use naturalistic and supernatural. That's why Darwinism cannot be ever academically removed from science until and unless methodological naturalism is removed. Now, I, I know I explained it in a long winded way, but I really want you to understand it's got nothing to do with science. This is a philosophical battle, a metaphysical battle, and that metaphysical battle, it colors the lens by which you look at the data. All data. Um, watch my debate with Skydive Phil in uh, Speaker's Corner. I put it on Twitter yesterday, right? Ultimately, it all begins off with what are your fundamental assumptions? And of course, the ultimate irony is that it is not the scientists who are coloring the lens with fundamental assumptions. The scientists are working the best they can with what tools they have. It is the theists who have the fundamental assumptions that are colouring their lens and their perception, as they insist that their supernatural entity must be a part of the explanation, 
despite not being able to demonstrate that with any evidence. Well, the only question I would have then is uh, what data is required for evolution to be modified, you would say, or at least Darwinism. contested, yeah, Darwinism, yeah. I would say intelligent design has to be accepted as an alternative. As a theory. Methodological naturalism stops intelligent design entering the door. Yep. If methodological naturalism is not re removed, Darwinism is always, always remain. But would that have control. any utility for science? That's the point. That's yeah. the point. Me and Paul Nelson, the series that we did, we, mm. we went over why it does. Mm. Why it actually does. And it does. Because look, essentially what intelligent design does, you have a toolbox and you have the biological world. The toolbox of the theist is naturalistic explanations and intelligent design explanations. The toolbox of the Darwinist only has naturalistic explanations. We can mix and match and use different tools. They can only use a few tools. Epistemically, we're superior. And this last segment demonstrates how Sabor is clueless and perhaps dishonest in the methodology of science and of his determination to include a religious explanation. 